Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Fall 2020 Exceptions to Virtual Activities Town Hall. My name is Kara Furman, and I will be your MC and guide for this town hall. My co colleagues, Fidel Garcia and Bernie Clinch, will be joining me today as well. I hope that everybody can hear me. Um, I do want to point out we do have closed caption available today, so if you need to click on the bottom um, of your screen for the CC, the closed captioning will be available. I've also posted in the chat the link for you to be able to go see it outside. Um, it'll be a parallel window that'll open up for you if you need to do that. So as usual, we're going to begin today's town hall with our webinar housekeeping rules, followed by the president's opening remarks. Our focus today will be on CSUDH's proposal for exceptions. We'll hear about housing and co-curricular activities and other topics before we switch to taking questions. The president will close our time out together with his closing remarks. We're collectively becoming really well versed in webinar etiquette, so a brief review of housekeeping rules. So please raise your hand to speak. We'll call on the speakers in the order of raised hands and offer the mic. You'll be able to unmute, unmute your mic and speak. If you don't have a mic or you don't wish to speak, please type your questions into the question and answer panel where our panelists will be reviewing and replying to your questions. We ask that you wait until the question and answer time to raise your hand and post your questions. And one final housekeeping note, the recording of this meeting will be made available on YouTube within 24 to 48 hours. And now I present to you your president, Dr. Thomas Parham. Thank you, Karen. Let me say good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this latest in a series of town halls where we're looking to keep you as informed as we can about latest updates. I uh, want to make sure we clarify in the midst of uh, our adjustments where we are with this particular town hall and why we've actually called this meeting. You'll recall that earlier in our town halls, we had occasion to share with you our plans going forward, which will exist principally in a virtual reality. As the provost has been very good about uh, articulating uh, the principal uh, virtual nature of our academic and co-curricular learning opportunities will be given in uh, Zoom, online, synchronous, asynchronous uh, opportunities to be able to do there. But there will be very, very limited exceptions for face-to-face. And that privilege has been granted to each of the presidents of the 23 California State University system. In my own mind, I want to reiterate the fact that we hold, right, as foremost in our thinking, the health, safety, and welfare of our campus community. And so I fully support and continue to support our campus and a system-wide decision to be able to move forward in a principally virtual reality, given the healthcare concerns we continue to be challenged by. But I also recognize that despite our best efforts, if we want to deliver a quality education, there are some things simply that cannot be done in a virtual fashion. And so I want to thank our faculty. I want to thank our department chairs. I want to thank our deans. I want to thank our provosts. I want to thank our various vice presidents, all of which have gone through uh, major work over the last several weeks. I want to thank our fall planning committees who've been working with folk, meeting with folk, talking with folk to make sure that we could submit to you what is going on uh, with this particular exception. So we are prepared to submit a document to the chancellor's office that articulates in a 12 point fashion, our proposal for the courses that we'd like to offer in a face-to-face uh, -face, uh, format versus the virtual. Uh, those exceptions by my direction uh, will be necessarily limited to somewhere between two and five percent. I think we've come in right at about four percent. So the purpose of this in the spirit of that broad consultation is simply to keep you in that loop about what is going on. Uh, these directives in part are being uh, delivered by the Chancellor's Office and we are being directed to comply with them in consultation with our public health officials. So please know that public health officials will be signing off on this plan as well. Uh, before I do and before it is uh, proposed to the Chancellor's Office. So what we present to you today is not what is etched in stone. Let me say that again. 
what we present to you today is not what is etched in stone. It is what we are proposing to the chancellor's office. So we have to wait for them to get back to us after their scrutiny to decide whether or not we have been approved to offer what it is that we are proposing. So with that, what I'd like to do is to uh, begin, as Kara has so uh, eloquently outlined our uh, agenda for the day. Uh, I'm gonna move on to talk about the proposal for exceptions. We'll talk about student affairs and housing co-curricular activities. We'll talk about the fall planning committee and, and share with you a little bit about that. We'll have uh, time for other matters as arise. And then we wanna spend the majority of our time this afternoon really hearing from you about any questions or concerns you have that need to inform our thinking going forward. So again, I thank all of you for joining us. And let me see if our provost, Mike Spagna, our second in command for the campus, has any uh, brief messages he'd like to deliver. Mr. Provost. Yes, thank you, President Parm. I, I appreciate that we're offering thanks and gratitude. So let me start by thanking the faculty, staff, and our administration for all your dedication uh, for providing excellent uh, academic instruction and services for our students. Uh, and that you've done this under extraordinary circumstances that we continue to navigate. So I want to also express that gratitude. I also want to share a little bit, just I think it is important for us to have a sequence of events. It's important to kind of, as the president uh, reinforced that, that in his opening remarks, this is one in a series of milestones going forward as we navigate this uncharted territory. So just a reminder for those of you who are keeping score here, back in uh, March, March 11th, we stopped instruction. We disrupted instruction in response to the stay at home and stay at home order. Uh, from the 12th to the 22nd of March, we then suspended instruction with an opportunity for faculty to upschool, upskill, retool, be able to provide support to get ready to provide alternative instruction. Uh, at that time, uh, from then until uh, beginning of May, we started wrestling with the idea of we're going to need a recovery team. So the president appointed a recovery team on May 13th. Uh, on May 14th, the chancellor's office finally declared, Chancellor White declared that all of fall 2020 would be virtual. Going forward from that date, uh, then there was the convening of our overall um, uh, recovery team. And finally, on May 25th, the chancellor's office published the requirements for being able to ask for exceptions. So between that May 25th date and today, June 18th, we've been actively engaged in broad consultation collaboration to try and put together uh, this document that many of you have seen and you've been working on for the last several weeks. I also want to share my thanks for the key people that have stepped up to champion this work, working hours each day and over weekends to try and get us prepared for this uh, submission to the Chancellor's Office. That is our writing team. Uh, led by Ken O'Donnell, along with Deborah and Arlene, respectively from Student Affairs and from Advancement. And then also you will meet a little later today, the uh, co-chairs of our Recovery Planning Committee, uh, Dang Chan Werewang and Cheryl Ku. So with that, President Parm, I'll turn it back to you as we start digging into the actual um, uh, report itself. Thank you, Dr. Spang, I appreciate that. So now, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to an individual who he and his team have just done some fabulous work. Uh, and that's our Associate Provost, Ken O'Donnell. Ken, take it away, and let's share with the people what the proposal for the exceptions is all about. Will do. Thanks a lot, Mr. President and Mr. Provost. Um, in addition to the writing team, Marlene Shikami and uh, Deborah Brandon and I, the, the production of this report was made possible really by project management help as well, uh, Deborah Robertson Sims and Marcy Payne in IT. Um, it was a team effort. It was five of us putting this document together, but I should emphasize that the document is really just a sliver of the work that's been going on at this university to get us ready to repopulate the campus in the fall. Um, I'm gonna share with you what the chancellor's office requested of us, what's in the document, and then I'll close with where this document sits in the context of the broader campus effort. And then I'll turn things back over to the president. With that communication on May 25th, the chancellor's office shared advice, guidelines, and a request all in one relatively large document. 
about how we might repopulate safely, prioritizing people's health as well as their learning. They said there are three areas where the chancellor wants the opportunity to approve before the campus commits to a plan. And all the other aspects of our planning for the fall are in the hands of our president. The three areas that are singled out for this report are instruction, on-campus housing and dining, and intercollegiate athletics. Now, as you know, there's an awful lot of other decision-making that has to happen as we plan for a fall semester as unusual as this one. There's nothing we're obliged to report about, for example, with advising or supplemental instruction or telecommuting. There's an awful lot that most of the folks on this uh, call have been thinking about working on. That in fact is the key to our resilience. The fact that our decision-making is as distributed as it is, that we're all really in this together and that we're using shared governance to the extent we can is why we were so ready to turn a report around this quickly. On those three areas of instruction, on-campus housing and dining, and intercollegiate athletics, the chancellor is asking us to address 12 points that go into detail on what our plans are for those three areas. Of those points, what the writing team did was spin them off to the different divisions that had been working on this and ask for a report on how is it going so far? What decisions have you made so far? Please write it up for us. Our job was to then synthesize that into the document that we're submitting to the chancellor. The, the last point that I wanna make is the role of this report in the context of the rest of the university's planning. You heard the provost talking about the timeline and the impaneling of our fall recovery committee. That group is continuing to do its work I don't think it's gonna be alone. I have a feeling there's so much communication and coordination ahead of us that we may be hearing about more committees to come or maybe existing committees that get repurposed for this. So even though this report is finished and about to be turned in, that's not to say the thinking is finished or that anyone who didn't get the chance to chime in so far has now lost that opportunity forever. A lot of the language in the request for the report from the chancellor's office was couched in things like, we know at this time it's just an estimate. We know you're working from incomplete information. How do you plan to go about such and such? So what we're sharing with them is, here's the list of classes we know about so far. As you heard the president say, that came to about 4%, so right about what we were aiming for. We don't know how many students we're gonna have in the fall. We don't know what our budget is gonna be in the fall. And we certainly don't know what the state of public health is going to be in the fall, what the state of the art will be for vaccinations or contact tracing or really any aspect of the pandemic that could further influence our plans. So we see this report to the chancellor's office as part of a dialogue with the CO, hopefully with other campuses as well. I think one of the best advantages of being in a system is that kind of collective thinking. So we're sharing our report with others. We hope to see theirs when they turn theirs in. I think we're a little bit ahead of the pack, but we want it that way. We want to get this done. We want to get a quick yes that we're on the right track, and then we want to get back to work. Uh, President Parham, with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Good, Ken, and, and thank you for that. Let me uh, invite us, if we can, so that um, we probably clear up a little bit of ambiguity in the air about what are the specific questions we have to answer in that 12 point checklist that are there. We don't want every detail, but let's see if we can give a broad brushstroke to our uh, uh, participants today and listeners about what those are. Sure, the questions begin with curriculum and instruction. Right. They ask us to name the courses that we've made exceptions to. Right. And th it's a list of about 128 courses um, it might be a little bit higher right now. It might have gone up to 133, but against the context of everything we teach, that's not going to change our percentage. Um, they're all over, but really they land in three broad categories predominantly. On campus, we're looking mostly at instruction from the College of Arts and Humanities, and mostly in the arts, where there's a lot of tactile learning that just can't be delivered over Zoom. Um, the other two colleges that came in with a lot of requests for exception were by and large asking for exceptions off campus. 
And that was our health college with their clinical placements and our college of education where they put teachers out in the field. We also, in those first few questions about curriculum and learning and instruction, described the arrangements that the College of Arts and Humanities has put together for what we are sometimes calling platooning, where we put students into subgroups so that we can make sure that the amount of, of human face-to-face -face traffic on campus at any one moment is as limited as we can make it. Um, they've, the faculty there have really come up with some elegant solutions about whose turn it is to come in when, how we make sure they stay further apart. They've also noticed that since some of our larger classrooms aren't likely to be in use, we could take some of those uh, instructional experiences and move them into spaces where social distancing is possible in a way that it wouldn't have been during a normal semester. From there, the questions go to on-campus dining and on-campus housing. Our answer there is it's going to be a pretty unusual semester. At housing, we plan, I think it's going to be less than a third of its usual capacity is, is going to be occupied. It might be around 25% or 20%. We're prioritizing the people who don't have choices. Um, we have uh, Toro Guardian Scholars who are foster youth who've aged out of the system and need a place to stay. We have some students who are just housing insecure. Um, those are the ones that are for sure, we want to do everything we can to give them a place to live. Um, the current version of the plan proposes, oh, thank you much for that slide. Um, am I getting ahead of myself with this level of detail, Mr. President? I, I know in some cases we might have had other speakers in mind. Yeah, no, in fact, I'm going to have Dr. Franklin cover some of this in a quick moment, but I wanted you just to give our, our audience exactly what you've given them, which is those are examples of the criteria we have to cover but I wanted to make sure that you understood that we as an administration or Ken O'Donnell and his group or Cheryl Coos and her group cannot do this work in absence of consultation with all of you and particularly the faculty who are the ones who have articulated what the exceptions ought to be, run those through their department chairs, run those through their deans, the deans to the provost, the provost to these committees. And so out of a list of some 2,800 approximately courses we're looking at, we're now down to 130, which is a little over 4%. That's really the measure of the work that is done, but it has not been done really by this administration. It has been done in consultation with faculty voices who have said to us what it is that they need to do and would like to do. So we just wanted to make sure that we reinforce that. And so the rest of the questions I think that, that Ken would articulate have to do with really the uh, plans going forward. Are you able to pe uh, provide uh, protective equipment, provide the cleaning in place for being able to do the social distancing uh, that you need to uh, engage in, uh, and how are you going to get that done? And by the way, do you have the financial resources to be able to afford it is where the document ends. So thank you, Ken, for that. And that um, uh, summary is a good way to let our audience know really the kind of factors that we're there. So again, we want to reiterate, consultation has been broad, despite some of the words that you have heard. Faculty have been involved. And also that this is simply a proposal around the exceptions to the virtual policy. The decision about whether we are going virtual has already been made and we are in that space and we have to wait. Again, this is a proposal we are sending to the chancellor's office, but we will not have confirmation about what we can and cannot do until this information is, is uh, brought back to us. So thanks, uh, Vice Provost O'Donnell, we'll appreciate you. Uh, let me call on Dr. Franklin, if you would and talk about some of the co-curricular learning and some of the spaces, particularly housing that we're talking about that Ken O'Donnell was about to pick up on. Dr. Franklin, if you would. Yeah, thank you. I think Ken did a fantastic job of setting this up and really having um, some conversation around some of the very difficult decisions that have to be made regarding to the co-curricular and housing being one of those who are the most principal in the mix. And this is a good example of how this plan is a snapshot in time and it is not the entire video reel and it is not some of the heavy lifting that we have been doing and will continue to do once this plan gets approved at the chancellor's office. There are so many in, uh, on this call who are student affairs professionals and folks who deliver the co-curricular and primarily in this plan, they're a little bit lost, but that doesn't mean that this plan is the be all end all. It means that it's a snapshot of those things that we need to consider 
at this moment, but we're going to be having some major considerations about our affinity centers, our, our supplemental instructors, our tutors, our advisors, those folks who work in the Women's Resource Center, some of the other places. Students spend a finite amount of time in the classroom and they spend a lot of time in co-curricular engagement in order to be successful and to graduate. We have some major work to do to begin looking at what those will look like in the fall. And as, as Ken said, and as the president said, that work is underway and this plan covers exactly what it needs to cover. It covers housing. How will our students who are housing insecure be able to get to campus and be a part of this experience? We have some students who will be in courses that will be taught um, either in a, you know, virtually and or in a hybrid where they may have to come to campus and those are those are on that list, they will need access to housing. And so those are the, the hard conversations that we're going to continue to have, but the co-curricular space and those in student affairs and outside of student affairs who deliver that type of co-curricular, we're going to ensure that this plan and any of our future planning really takes that into consideration. And, and the last thing I'll say, which is really clear, this is a great example. The housing example is a great example of how this plan is a snapshot. The president, um, um, Deborah, Deb, Deb Wallace and I took a tour of our brand new housing. That building is not even being considered as we speak in the plan, but we have some plans that we can perhaps safely open that building and consider putting students in that building also, but that is nowhere near and in the plan right now, it's still underway. So I'll end there and just say that this is an opportunity to make sure that this snapshot that we're giving to the Chancellor's Office is very clear, but the video reel will contain a whole lot more that we need to consider in order to ensure that our students have a first and class experience in fall 2020. Yeah, thank you for that, Dr. Franklin. As I remind folk, a snapshot is very different than the videotape. This is a snapshot, but it also underscores the fact that this process is a dynamic one, not a static one. So as Ken reinforced, as Dr. Franklin did after him, and I want to reiterate that even if we have not had a chance to put everything fully baked into this plan, we can always submit amendments to it but these are the specific criteria that the uh, Chancellor's Office is looking for. Um, I wanna also just take a moment and, and call on him one of these unexpected alley-oop no look passes to uh, Vice President Manriquez because so much of what we're doing is involving our technology. And let me give uh, Chris an opportunity to weigh in real quick about some of the technological things that we're having to navigate in order to uh, uh, submit this proposal moving forward, Chris. No, thank you for the moment, President P, and another great no look pass. Um, want to go ahead and communicate with the group that uh, what we're doing with this plan in particular is adding to already a reservoir of information we've already had directly from faculty and students and others on campus regarding technology areas that we need to go ahead and continue to bolster. So this plan, which is critical and necessary for us to integrate with the chancellor's office and be able to move forward those exceptions that we believe are core to what we're doing, it adds to the supplemental information that we also have from many other sources in order to build out the infrastructure. As part and parcel of this, we will continue to receive information from multiple places and do have kind of a five point strategy working with our other colleagues on campus to address the different needs on campus around technology. Some of those fall specifically within the areas of faculty and staff rollout, student rollout is kind of a new provisioning on the campus, uplifting of infrastructure on Wi-Fi and capabilities to build out continued nuanced structures on the campus as we move forward. And then looking at also enabling technology for our adjunct and part-time service providers on the campus and ways that can be addressed. Most critical and also included in this is the way that we're going to construct and build out labs and the degree to which we're going to be able to facilitate that with technology. Each one of these has uh, groups of people that are engaged in building out and trying to scale and scope what is needed for each one, each one as you cross both the direct instructional and co-curricular activities, as well as some of the services we're gonna to continue to need to support on the student services side, everything that we wanna to continue to deliver as much as we can in the virtual that may not be physically present. So do know that those activities are continuing to occur in parallel with and in conjunction with the plan we've developed. Thank you for the time, sir. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chris, and, and appreciate that. But I just wanted our audience to know that, that the consultation that we are doing is not simply about the content and the courses we're looking to do, but really the methodology and the operations about how we're looking to 
try to upgrade and do what we can around our technological sophistication and uh, ability to deliver. Uh, let me now call on uh, Cheryl Coos and uh, Dang uh, Chan Weerwong to really talk about the fall planning committee because they have been uh, really good about that. And again, this is a process that as they are a small entity, they are not simply making independent decisions absent feedback and consultation with the folk who are around them to continue with the fall planning. So let me turn it over to Cheryl and Dane. You want me to go first, Dr. Kuz? Hello, I'm Dane Shanweer Wong, Associate Vice President for Student Success, and I'm co-chairing the Fall Recovery Committee um, with Dr. Kuz and working with an amazing team of com about 10 committee members who um, we helping us moving our work forward. We've been meeting since um, we were charged on May 5th, no, May 4th. And we started meeting on May 7th and been meeting every day since until now. Um, we have been meeting with lots of people and groups and I will let Dr. Kuz introduce herself and share more. Thanks, Dang. Um, so I'm Cheryl Coos, AVP for Faculty Affairs and Development. And Dang and I just wanted to share a bit more about what we've been doing regarding consultation and the groups that we've been meeting with specifically. So um, we've met with Senate exec twice. Um, we've met with ASI officers. We've met with representatives from CFA, CSUEU, APC, um, we've met with Adam Casarda from Student Disabilities Resource Center. Um, we've met with Provost Ken O'Donnell um, twice and the, and the Provost as well. Um, we have upcoming time certains meet um, already scheduled. So um, we are more than happy to schedule faculty and, um, and different stakeholders who wish to talk with the committee about their concerns so we can communicate them to the president and the cabinet. And in addition, we have developed three different surveys, one for faculty, one for staff, and one for students. The student surveys um, will be closed today. The faculty survey closed with 298 faculty responded. Um, the staff survey with about almost the same amount, 30% of staff responded to the survey. And um, so now we're just hoping we get good number of students who respond to the survey and give us um, feedback. All of that will be um, combined and put into a report, a comprehensive report. It's being developed by the committee and we're putting all, the, all that together at the end before that would be our final task to make our recommendation to the cabinet. Yeah, thank you both. And before we um, let you uh, uh, leave and mute yourselves, what I want to do is invite our uh, tech gurus to put up the slides about the fall planning recovery because it really does show the level of extensive consultation that this team has tried to engage in in order to do that. So if we can put up that first slide and show our uh, audience. So you'll notice on this first slide that beginning as early as May 4, all the way through, there have been just numerous meetings with different individuals, different personnel around. And as you move from senior leadership, chancellor's office, different town halls, Senate exec committee, CFA reps, back to the chancellor's office, student affairs, CSUEU, and go on to the next slide you'll see that even through June, that level of consultation and seeking input has still arrived. So what we wanna do is make sure that you know that the Fall Recovery Planning Committee is still in existence. We are still soliciting input. This is not a fully baked cake. It is an opportunity for you to provide whatever feedback, concerns, questions, or other things that we need to consider. And both Cheryl and Dane will be glad to receive your feedback, chronicle it, and then channel it into those of us who are, are, are meeting uh, with both academic senate as well as senior administration and cabinet to try to make the best decision forward. So anything else, Cheryl, today? I just wanted to make sure we gave the audience a sense of how extensive some of the consultation has been and, and the groups you've been meeting with. Sounds good, thank you. 
Okay, good. Thank you both. So we can take that slide down now. And what I'd like to do uh, as we move into other matters that uh, arise is really to, uh, first of all, again, because I see more folk have joined us, is I want to extend uh, uh, my sincerest thanks and congratulations and, and uh, gratitude, really, to uh, our deans, to our associate and assistant deans, to our department chairs, and to our faculty who have done just your person's work at being able to create this document that we are now moving forward as an exception to what it is we are trying to promote. So even as we are looking forward to uh, uh, you know, planning and, and fully crystallizing what our plan is gonna be for the fall semester, we cannot do so in absence of consultation with all of you. And I simply just wanna thank you for all your input in helping us to make the most informed decision and put forward the best proposal we can. Hopefully we'll get that approved by the chancellor's office. So now what I'd like to do, Kara, is put a pause on our kind of management team and see if we can't go to any questions uh, or folk in the chat to see if there are any hands raised that we might answer any questions that people have about this process. Indeed, we can. Uh, there are, we have not opened up the questions yet, but they are available to the attendees if you would like to pose your questions or remarks. We do have Nora Garcia who has her hand up. Nora, we're going to release the mic and you are welcome to speak. Hi, Nora. One more time, Nora. Go ahead. Going to unmute yourself. There you go. Nori, we can see your microphone's on. Go ahead. Oh, now it's off. Okay, right. we'll, we'll move oh. on. We'll maybe come back to Nora. Here we go. Yes, so actually the open and answer questions are, are available if you would like to pose your questions or your remarks in there. Please do so, or if you'd like to raise your hand. Um, we do have quite a few people that are on a call. If you would like to um, use that, the opportunity to speak, we can certainly try to use the last four digits of your phone number to pull you up. Um, there are a lot more than usual on a phone call, but you do have the ability, uh, depending on the phone that you're using, to either raise your hand or what we can do is just start going down the list, um, potentially to see if you have a question or a comment. Okay, so we have some questions coming through now. Um, question is, were there any considerations for on-campus library service services for the fall semester? So the short answer is yes, and let me uh, invite our provost to weigh in as well, as well as Dean Braisley, I think if she's available, but, um, Every consideration was made for us to utilize all facilities, but recall that what we have to do is pay attention to health and safety concerns primarily. And right now in the county, the incidence and prevalence data suggest that the numbers are not even close to stabilizing um, and that they still are expecting, I think, a, uh, a new trend to uh, uh, increase in the fall. So for right now, we are being told to uh, limit the amount of exposure that we have in spaces where people can gather, even though we have been having conversations with that. And there, in fact, is a plan in place, I think, that uh, Dean Brazley has talked about with our provost um, to be able to look at that. So, Mike Spagnon, let me turn it over to you and have you address that. As yes, well. thank you. I, I don't think that Dean Brazley can, could be on the video conference at the start, but she will join us a little later. I know we have Associate Dean Marwin Brito, who is also uh, in the video conference, but I will share with everybody that the, the library has put together a very comprehensive plan. Uh, they have operating principles uh, in time of a pandemic, and they have a four-phased program uh, set up to attenuate kind of uh, repopulation and coming back for services. Phase one is what we're currently in, uh, moving into a phase two and a phase three and a phase four. Some of the highlights for this is really in phase one that we're currently in, it's kind of full digital. 
So it's full digital online resources through the library. The library building itself is not accessible, but a lot of the services they provide are digital. Um, in phase two, there is a plan to go forward as restrictions start to relax to go with the staff only on site. So again, no students yet, but staff performing services and supporting. Phase three, if restrictions relax a little more, move to minimal and limited users on site. And then hopefully crossing our fingers, uh, possibly into the spring, we get into a phase four where we have full on-site operations. So they have this, they also have it connected to the, the state and county mandates. They have building office uh, hours of operation being very virtual for the first phase and second phase with limited hours in phase three and more extensive hours in phase four. So you'll see this ac across a lot of our plans and it's a good question related to the library. The same kind of phased approach is being used with our research area that's not contained in this report, but how do we get faculty and students back in, involved in research? Again, a multi-phase plan. So uh, I'll, I'll end there, but that they have a very comprehensive plan as to what they're going forward with in the fall. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And, and, and while you have the mic, um, there's a question that I see from Miguel Lopez, who is asking, um, is there an estimation of when non-essential uh, staff may return to work? But before we get to that, I see one from Sharon um, Witteroff, who is asking in the Department of Social Work, there are about 200 students in field placements and consider social workers essential workers. When will the revised MOU amendment from the Chancellor's Office be released so that they can best prepare as they're currently placing students right now? And I know you and your team have been working on that. Yeah, now, great, great question. It's been consuming a lot of our time in the last 72 hours because we have a lot of these contracts for clinical placements that are currently underway and then proposals for the fall. So Vice President Deb Wallace, I don't think she could join us in this town hall, but Deb Wallace has been working very closely with us. So the update here is that we have a key person in procurement, Maria Hernandez, who's been working really closely with us. And there's an email that goes out that has been going out to the site coordinators about all the current agreements and that those are all being amended for all students that are in clinical site placements right now. We, with Maria's help, they've developed a one-page protocol. It basically says that existing arrangement that you have in place stays in force, and we're making sure you're aware that we continue to work with you. And then, as we have to revise agreements going into the fall, we'll be working closely with individual chairs and faculty. MSW is a good example. We have a lot in the College of Health, Human Services, and Nursing. We also have agreements in education. So we're trying to streamline this as quickly as possible to get these agreements so that they're in force, that they're supportive, they don't work against our students. And most importantly, from my standpoint, we don't want to exceed any ground to competitors. There are other universities in the LA Basin that also want clinical sites, and we don't wanna lose these clinical sites that we've had long relationships with. So my hat's off to Maria and everything she does in procurement. Procurement, I really appreciate uh, Deb Wallace taking this up and working with us in academic affairs and with the departments. So very good question, and it's something that we're actively on, and we are not gonna lose any internships for offsite placements, and we'll make sure that these contracts are back in force, and that it doesn't take weeks and months to get that in place. Great. Um, oh, if thanks. I may just oh. ask real quickly, uh, Dr. P, Sharon is actually got her hand raised as well. Um, would you like to have her um, respond? Yes, yes okay. we can uh, respond to that and then I'll get to the other question by uh, Miguel Lopez. Go ahead, Sharon. Good afternoon. Sharon, you're, you have the mic. If you would like to follow up, it may be that you had the same question and you raised your hand, but you have the mic now. You can unmute yourself. No? Nope. We'll, we'll come back to you then. Did it work? Am I oh, on? There, you go. there, you. Yes. there she is. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Parham and President Parham. Uh, just to follow up, thank you, uh, Provost Spagna, uh, for answering that question. We just wanted to know if you uh, have a sense of when we might see that? Um... Well, you should see it. You should see it in the next 24 hours. I mean, I, as the president will tell you in the cabinet, I've been uh, uh, really pushing on this front. And I know particularly in MSW, you have a lot of clinical sites. So that communication from Maria back to you to make sure you can use that with the clinical sites. I know you serve in a coordinator role 
in MSW, we want to support you in that. So you look for it in 24 hours. You don't hear from that in 24 hours. You're going to text me or email me directly uh, so we can take care of it. We can't afford to let that go long. So, and, I, and also Sharon, thank you for all the work you do in, in MSW. It's one of our, we're very proud of that program and it's exceptional in the CSU. Thank you so much, appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for that, stay safe. Uh, let me go back, Kara, to uh, Miguel uh, Lopez, who asked, is there an estimation on when non-essential staff might return to work? Short answer to that is, I don't know. Uh, I would love to be able to be back to work like today, uh, if I could, but right now the guidance, uh, both from the chancellor's office from uh, all the public health indications and numbers are that we are still in virtual mode until further notice. So uh, we will let you know as soon as we can on that piece. Uh, there's another question I wanna uh, kick again to Dr. Franklin, uh, where they're asking about uh, on what basis are we deciding what students will be admitted to uh, the dorms or allowed to really reside in the dorms? And there are a couple of quick answers to that, but Dr. Franklin, why don't you take that one? Yeah, fantastic question. We have uh, right now about four criteria. We're looking at those students who are former foster youth who do not have places to go and they're currently in our housing. Many of them never moved or left our housing unit. We're also looking at those students who might be housing insecure or homeless. And we certainly have a good connection with those students working with our Morgan, Kirk and our basic needs coordinators and, and, and Joshua Williams. They've given us a good indicator of who those students are in those categories. We also have some students for compelling employment reasons. I mean, compelling, they have to live close to campus because the job requires them to do that. And we don't want them to then become housing insecure or food insecure, but not being able to stay in housing and work um, in the job that, give, that is their livelihood. And fourth and not last, we have some students who will be in a hybrid situation or a course that has to meet and they live, let's say in Victorville, where there's no way they can commute in for that lab on Tuesday and Thursday. And so those are the only considerations that we're giving right now for those students who will be staying in housing. But as I indicated earlier, the president, along with Deb Wallace, along with Lynn Author, Matthew Smith, we're all in conversations around that brand new bright and shining residence hall that just opened up. Is there a way to broaden this list and to safely and securely bring students back to campus using strict CDC and public health guidelines and provide a living and learning experience in our new residence hall. We are still um, in wet cement in terms of determining that, but so far those are the four criteria for who we're considering in this plan that's going in. Exactly right, thank you for that. Uh, there's another question I'm reading from Susan Needham about will faculty be able to use their offices in delivering virtual classes? Mr. Provost, you wanna take that one? Sure, there's kind of a two-part answer to that. Um, so that we already, uh, after we had instruction disrupted in March, we have had individual faculty under limited circumstances coming in to their offices to be able to do everything from working in labs to be able to do some recorded lectures and recorded sessions. So that stuff will continue in terms of, you know, making requests and having you come in. One of the things we're trying to do is centralize access for the campus. So in that way, faculty can not have to go through three or four stages to request access. And again, we're balancing this with health concerns and making sure that you're safe coming back. But for anyone in specific that is interested in coming or needs to come to campus, you should be working directly with me and academic affairs as we centralize this process so you can get access. Again, I think you'll hear the president say over and over again, the campus is open, but that doesn't mean that we are not still in a virtual remote learning environment. So we wanna keep that in mind and again, if you get to us individually, we're doing our best to try and get you access to campus. We need to know when you're coming in. We need to know how you can get into your space. And we need to know also to make sure that we don't have density in areas and we make sure that we clean and take care of that from a safety standpoint. Right, and going back to Dr. Franklin, it's starting to sound like a, a ping pong table between the two of you. Uh, another one of our, our guests is asking about, what about international students in housing? Dr. Franklin, what about international students? Yeah, folks are being asked about international students, being asked about athletes. We're trying to look at those four criteria. If an international student is coming 
into the campus from and, and can't go back to their home country or where they are, then that's housing insecure and they would be considered similarly for an athlete. So it's more so looking at those four criteria for now to consider in terms of housing, but just being in because you know, many of our international students have lived locally and attend local community colleges and are not necessarily housing insecure or stay near and around um, um, the campus. So it depends on the student and those four criteria are what we're using right now to determine who lives in, in housing. Okay, thanks. Carl, let me go back to you. What other questions do we have? Well, there is a question from Lauren Ansorge, and I think it was in relation to what Sharon had been asking as she was addressing provost. Um, and the question is, will this be the same for the COE student teaching slash intern placements? So yeah, the, the short, the short, I saw that also, uh, Kara, thank you. And the short answer is yes. I mean, we're applying the College of Education is in the same situation of clinical placements. In their case, the clinical placement are schools. And remember, again, that depending on whether you're talking about Inglewood or you're talking about LA Unified, the various K-12 schools are on different timelines themselves. So, but those, the, there are two items here. One is the negotiated contract. So we're gonna make sure that those contracts stay in effect. But then as the schools reopen and as they allow us to be able to place uh, student teachers in this case or interns there, we'll make sure that we have those in place as well. So the short answer, Lauren, is yes. We're treating it in the same way under the clinical placements. I also wanna point out that the clinical placements are not addressed in this exceptions plan. That is a separate thing that we have control over on our local campus. Uh, so we do not need to submit that to the chancellor's office to get approval. It's more of us dealing with it internally. Same thing with research. We have some degrees of freedom in terms of how we do that. That's different from this exceptions plan, which really gets to those four areas we started out with. Right, but we should also, I think, remind uh, our participants that uh, even with those degrees of freedom, all of those places will have to meet the strict criteria right. that have been imposed and we have imposed to make sure we protect the health and safety of our folks. So if a, a placement cannot ensure that they are prepared to protect the health and safety of our students, that is not something we're prepared to green light. So that's there. And that relates to another question that somebody asked in our, uh, our Q&A box about there are rumors about schools getting ready to open. So does that mean that CSUDH will be ready to open? And I can tell you the short answer to that is, mm, I don't think so. Um, we have to do things in, in, in partnership with uh, our strategic stakeholders. So that's absolutely true. But I just finished a call uh, with my chief of staff this morning with uh, one of our local school districts meeting their new principals and talking about things. And they had not even made plans to decide uh, who's coming back, how they're platooning their students, how they're gonna screen them when they come in. Are they testing folk? Do they have a capacity to trace all the students? None of that is in place. And so when we hear about, uh, they're thinking about opening up, I want us to be careful about just embracing, I think what we hear in the broader brush stroke of the news, because unless everybody's prepared to meet those same criteria, um, you know, I don't think that uh, uh, that's likely to be able to uh, yield the kind of, of, of opening uh, that they're looking for. Uh, Cara, other questions? Okay, let's go back to the uh, the live questions. F. Dell, you have your hand raised. You have the microphone. Welcome. Go ahead. How's it going? How's it going? So our first class, Delgado. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right. Uh, so our first class, Delgado, with the ROTC here at CSUDH. Uh, we were trying to forecast if we're going to be able to conduct our Friday labs. It's a three-hour lab. Uh, sometimes we do physical training and um, other outdoor activities, you know, as far as tactics and maneuvering. Um, along with that, sometimes we, uh, the cadets will come in and we'll, they'll do physical training. Uh, do you foresee us being able to uh, um, facilitate that with the precautions of, you know, so, uh, distancing and checking thermometers and, you know, doing the waiver uh, and whatnot? So the short answer is, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask uh, the provost, and I'm sorry, Deborah Wallace is not there. Uh, is I don't know. I mean, if I draw a parallel to what we've done in athletics, what we've done is suspended athletics from both competition, from practice, from training, and from travel. Even as we have invited them to try to sustain kind of the team concept and keep coaches and assistant coaches and other folks connected because we want to recognize that these are students 
first, not athletes first, and we certainly want to maintain and help them be successful here. I think when we parallel that to what goes on with the ROTC and training, we have to make sure that if there's training there, that there are physical distance in requirements in place, that there are masks being worn, that we can go back and clean facilities behind that. So all that has to be proposed and sent. So if you're looking to do that, I would send that proposal forward to uh, our provost and see what we can do about trying to get a specific answer to that question for you. Yeah, I would, I would add to that to say that I've seen in the Q&A that there have been some requests about uh, can they see the document. I think the document was also attached to this invitation. So we want to make sure people look back at the document related to the exceptions. But I, I want to go back to something that our Vice Provost Ken O'Donnell said, which is remember, and the President reinforced this, this is not a static uh, operation. This is an ongoing dialogue. So as the President said, if you have an activity that you want to see whether or not we can get an exception for, you need to get it to us. So I do know that ROTC, the program working within CBAP, that's their home college, they put forward exceptions. But if this was not covered as part of that, please get to me immediately. Again, these are things that we have to keep in mind. We're going to be going through this dialogue for the next several weeks and months. So get it to me directly. Thank Hi. you. Uh, this is Joseph. <clears throat> Uh, yes, we uh, we did submit it uh, ROTC request uh, to uh, vice provost. So that's depending on the president's approval. Good, thank you for that. So we'll take a look at that again and measure it against all the other criteria that we've had. There's yeah. another related question, uh, uh, Carl. Before we go back to uh, uh, live questions, uh, that comes from Nicole Rodriguez, who reminds us, "Hey, Nicole." Uh, who reminds us that we're getting a lot uh, uh, of questions from employers and students about internships uh, for not-for-credit internship positions that will require in-person interviews and in-person fall internships. Don't quite know what those are, and particularly if they're requiring them, which is, is interesting. This transition is happening now in industry space. Do we have a policy or procedure preventing this in-person professional engagement? Uh, and the short answer is no, we are not policing the activity of people that is unrelated to right, the activities that they're involved in here on campus. However, I do uh, say that with the following caution, that as different cities and municipalities and areas are uh, allowing different restaurants, et cetera, to open up, different beaches to open up, different uh, facilities to open up and people engage it, if in fact you are out and about engaging in any of these activities, I want you to be very, very careful about your level of exposure. Because even if a business is allowing you to go out and do something face to face, what you can never guarantee is whether they are practicing the full social distancing requirements, the mask, the cleaning, all those other things that are there. And what you sometimes don't know is whether or not you are likely to be exposed from someplace off campus and then bring that back into more on-campus spaces. And I wanted just to be very, very concerned about that, but also due diligence because when we say we are all in this together, literally we have to look out for one another and make sure that we understand that if we are out in those other spaces where we're doing any kind of face-to-face -face contact, that we are taking the appropriate precautions to make sure that we are ourselves being screened, tested, and make sure that everybody else is following the guidelines that we have set up. Can I add to that a little bit? You can add to two things to that, Dr. Franklin. You no, know, just want to say that that is the exact type of question that anyone who's posing should come before Dr. Dang and Dr. Sherrill's committee to have further conversation. They are following the CDC guidelines, public health guidelines. They're talking to our local folks. That committee is doing your person's work to ensure that any scenario like that, both on campus, in the campus community, that we're taking all those things into consideration. That's the exact example of this being a video reel and more conversation and more consultation is in order. We're not in this alone and we're working with our public health folks to ensure that we can cover all the, that's, a, that's the exact kind of question that this this forum may not be designed to address, but that fall planning committee is put in place as one of their charges to address. Yeah, excellent point. And uh, I'll be with you in a second, Mr. Provost. I think there's a related question about, uh, there's a concern about bookstore needs to be accessible in some safe format 
as all materials are not accessible to all students via digital or shipping? And is it possible that a non-student access to from the external world can be made available? That is safety criteria. That is one of the questions and suggestions that we want to send to our fall recovery planning committee so that they can begin to review that, talk about that with our uh, staff in the emergency operations center, review that against the criteria and see what we can do about working out. So thank you for the suggestion as well. Mr. Provost, you had a hand. Yeah, in monitoring the uh, Q&A box, there's a question that we anticipated and I wanna prepare Ken O'Donnell to be able to address this. It's the larger issue that, that comes as a challenge with asking for exceptions. How do you make sure that we don't have confusion among students about if they're signed up for a course section? Is it online? Is it hybrid? Where is it gonna take place? And so we're really working forward to try and get away from some of that confusion. So it's clearly identified for students and they're not confused. And so Ken and Yvette Nava in Academic Affairs and the course schedulers, they've all been working nonstop on this to make sure that we really minimize any confusion. And what we don't wanna have is we don't wanna have a chaotic environment where students are expected to be at a certain time in a synchronous class that's virtual. And then all of a sudden they have some competing class where someone else has put it at the same time. So we're trying to avoid this going forward. And I thought it would be important for Ken to spend a minute or two just to describe our plans going forward because this has come up many times. And again, we wanna support our students and faculty so that they're not tripping over each other, Ken. That sounds great, thank you. Um, it is a very important question and it's communication I think is gonna be really key going forward. We have online posted class schedules that were created back before the pandemic because we do our class schedule planning pretty far in advance. Um, in the time since then, we've been going through those postings and scrubbing them, taking away the physical locations for the majority of classes and replacing it with the phrase alternative instruction. There was a question in the chat box for this meeting. In that case, can you also remove the days and the times of the meeting so that we can see what's, when things might conflict and when they won't conflict? In that case, we're waiting and keeping the posted days and times because we don't wanna release that hold on the student's personal schedule until we're sure what the faculty are planning. We've asked the faculty, do you want your course to meet in real time or do you want it to be the more traditional kind of online class where it really doesn't matter when you log in and do your learning? In many cases, the faculty are either still going through the professional development that will help them prepare a good answer to that question. In other cases, the faculty haven't been assigned to the class yet. We still have some where the named assignment is staff, where to be determined. And so in all of those cases where there's any ambiguity, we're continuing to publish the stated time and day that the class will be meeting so that students know they shouldn't schedule another class at the same time. Yeah, good, thank you for that, Ken. And um, that makes sense. As we continue to, uh, to answer questions and I appreciate everybody being in the chat box, let me go back to Kara and see if you have any other folk who have a live question they'd like to ask any of us. We do, and Diana Uloa, your hand is raised. Go ahead. Hi, Diana. Diana, you have the floor if you wanna unmute yourself. I think it was a mistake, sorry. That's all right, that's okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on to Jennifer Broadman. Go ahead. You have the mic. Jennifer? Okay, we'll come back to you. Russell, you are next. Russell. Hello. Hello? Uh, hi, Russell. Hey, Dr. Barnum. Um, so for this meeting, this means that um, this fall is going to interact the way that last semester ended, um, but it's going to be a full semester of virtual interaction. That is correct. So that decision about us going virtual has essentially already been made, but you hear us use language, and I want to be intentional about this, that we are principally virtual. And what that means is that for the most part, we will be both uh, Zoom, uh, online, synchronous, asynchronous instruction, all of that. But for a very limited number of exceptions, between two and 5% of them, and our number is now four, we will be doing some face-to-face. -face. 
And those things are proposals that are coming forward from faculty and departments and deans into our system that we are then putting into a proposal that we are now sending off to the chancellor's office for approval. But the principal uh, uh, mode of both academic and co-curricular learning and activity that will take place on campus in the fall through December of 20 will be virtual in nature. That's correct. Thanks, Russell, for that question. Curti, you are next. Go ahead. Dr. Sally, how are you? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, President Parham. I'm well. I hope, if, I hope all of you are well at the pace you're working. Um, I've been spending, I've spent uh, last week and this week in, in various boot camps led by my peers. Many of them are lecturer, part-time lecturer faculty. Uh, Jennifer Broadman, who I just had mentioned, is one of our assistant professors. It has been an incredibly powerful peer-to-peer -peer, um, educational opportunity. And I would say we are probably about 60 of us, plus or minus maybe up to 80, that have been able to take advantage of, the, of these boot, count, boot camps last week in this. My question is one that has emerged from several faculty members during discussion in these boot camps. Um, and I'm going to just uh, paraphrase as best as I can on behalf of the faculty that are so involved. We're, really, we're looking forward to hearing how, so let me paraphrase this question, how is our students going to be prepared and supported for success in their online classes over and above what we do within our classes? Will there be student orientations that are specific uh, for them, opportunities for them to do the kinds of things we are doing in boot camps that preface the beginning of the semester? Excellent question. Uh, let me uh, cue up Dr. Franklin, who has been doing a magnificent job along with his team. And Dr. Franklin, I'm going to ask you to do two things, sure. because we've been talking about um, you know, our student enrollment and what that looks like. We should perhaps give them a snapshot along with you and, and, and uh, Deborah Brandon about what our snapshot looks like and the kind of preparations that are going into place with our new student orientations that are going forward. So if you would take the mic and uh, share yeah, with us. With, with, with Dr. Kaselli's fantastic question. Um, again, I, in my opening statement, I talked about how that plan, that snapshot, did not go into the level of detail that it, it perhaps should um, about student engagement and student connection and ensuring that our students can navigate this virtual world, whether asynchronous or synchronous successfully. And that's one of the reasons why I'm making another pitch that Dr. Dang did in her opening statement about that student survey that's being circulated now. If you know students, you have student assistants, you're connected to them, make sure that they take that survey. We're trying to get a comprehensive understanding about how they navigated this experience in the spring, the good, the bad, and the indifferent. And we're trying to take that critical information and data, triangulate it, and turn it into a series of upskilling working with Chris and his team in terms of working with student affairs professionals and co-curricular professionals in terms of trying to create an experience that's first in class for our students. We all went home in mid-May and did the best, in mid-March and did the best we could, but it taught us some things. And not only did it teach us some things, we have to learn what we didn't know and then do things different and do things better. Before I talk about enrollment, let me see if Dr. Dang has anything else to add to what I just said. Um, for the virtual learning, I wanted to share that Dr. Kim Castillo and um, Dean of Undergraduate Studies, as well as Dr. Ann Choi, are developing um, online courses to help students learn how to be effective learner online for all of our students. And also um, joining together, we will have workshops um, on different learning topics um, relating to, you know, how to take notes, how to do um, readings and everything online throughout the summer and the fall through our programmings and as well as through the Office of Under 
Excellent. And let me just wrap up with what the president said. And I'll do this in a real snapshot. Um, our enrollment is very healthy. I, I really want to thank Dr. Brandon and, and, and the team and enrollment management. Our new student enrollment is tracking where we hoped it would and where we thought it would and where we sort of, well, there are a lot of algorithms that we use to assess new students. And we kind of hit this one right on the nail. Um, and by extending our deadline from May 1 intent to enroll to June 1, that helped us not only do well, but it also helped our students begin to come in um, in the way that we were hoping they would. What we did not anticipate and what we have no real attributions for other than all the folks who are in these squares and what we do in, in, in this as a team and all of you who are online, our continuing student enrollment is tracking so far above where we were in the last three years that we just have no way to attribute it to anything other than what the provost has been saying, we must re-recruit our, our continuing students. And so we did, we left no stone unturned. We, there were a lot of financial holds that were released, a lot of advising holds that were released, deans and associate deans and advisors in the advising homes, EOP, ETE, UATC, all those folks reached out and our returning student enrollment is very healthy. Our challenge now, and that's why I'm glad I'm not the president, is what will we do if we're over enrolled by a little bit? That is our challenge. And unlike some of our central and Northern California CSUs, the narrative will not be around under enrollment. And we will, every marginal cost, every dollar, we will recuperate for those students. And so I'm happy to, I'm happy the president added that as a part of the conversation for the 300 plus folks who are on. Enrollment is healthy. And I wanna thank you all for helping us get there. You know, two things I'll say about that, and then let me turn it over to the provost. Um, it's kind of like, what happens if you throw a party and everybody wants to come? I want people to come get some of this excellence at Cal State University, Dominguez Hills. And if the fact that our uh, freshman numbers have not shrunk too much, that our uh, continuing numbers, in fact, have uh, recorded at higher levels than we have, will show us at least they're at or maybe even just a tad above, I think that's a good kind of problem to have. There are problems of success, my friends, and problems of failure. That is a problem of success. When we have new infrastructure uh, being born by the day, when we have new programs coming online, when we have new accreditations popping up, why wouldn't students want to come get some of what we have here at Cal State University of Dominguez Hills? Lastly, I'll say that uh, what Dang talked about and Dr. Franklin talked about the student survey and the opinions are, are very important uh, related to what Dr. Selly asked. And that is because it is difficult to design interventions in absence of consultation with the people that the intervention is designed to serve. And so what we wanna do is really take a, a, a really uh, a good look uh, and interrogate very deliberately what it is that they believe they'll need so that when we design specific programs, it will actually meet the needs that they have. But in the same way that we are talking about uh, putting forward uh, uh, professional development opportunities for faculty and staff, we will also have those opportunities for students so that they learn how to be maximally successful in an environment that we are all adapting to. Uh, Mr. Provost, you had a hand. Let me call on you. Yeah, just uh, to build on what Vice President Franklin said and uh, Dr. Chair Werewang, I mean, the, the, we are working right now on a master calendar that will go out to all students that will show them when they can partake in this. So, so we want to get that out there, and that just came up in the Q&A as well. But I also want to point out that we talk a lot about recovery. Even our committee was identified as a recovery committee. We've talked a lot about reimagining uh, what we do with students. And so I will really have all of us think about portability portability of expertise and competencies and portability of equipment and technology. It doesn't seem right to me that we have to have students, for instance, graduate from high school, they have technology and a laptop, but as soon as they graduate and they're ready to matriculate, we take the laptop back. So I, I have to believe that in our work with colleagues and with people in industry, we can get a commitment to have the technology that's portable that students can depend on as opposed to us giving it to them and then taking it away based on whether they're graduating from high school, have they matriculated to college, did they graduate from college? We shouldn't have these disruptions, especially for our community where we, we give technology and then take it away. We want it so it's universal and they can all uh, use that. Same thing with portable skills. 
for students. You want them to be able to navigate an online environment and then that can go with them internally as they go from one to the next. So I just wanna say there's, there's examples of how we as a community at Dominguez Hills have to work with our external partners also so that we have a little more cohesive planning to support our students in the area. Uh, there we go. I want to use that as an opportunity to uh, give our Vice President for Information Technology, Chris Manriquez, and his old, entire team some love because I've been pushing him over the last two years to come up and construct a plan that will actually close the digital divide. And what he's been doing is just a magnificent job of trying to lay that out. And as I mentioned to you before, my friends, that in the midst of what we're doing with this crisis, crisis reveals character. It also exposes weakness. It also creates opportunity. Well, the weakness that has been exposed is in our technological infrastructure. And it's not only looking at the equipment we have, the facilities that we have or don't have, but it also is looking at the technological sophistication of our users and their ability to really function in this virtual world. And those are the kind of things that uh, Dr. Manriquez uh, and his team, I should say Vice President Manriquez and his team are using to be able to do that. So wanted to just uh, talk about that. Also, before I go back to Cairo, while I have the mic, I want to respond to a couple of questions I've seen twice now that say, I have not heard any plans on what will be the new cleaning and sanitizing standards for the campus. And are those methodologies being examined and when will that knowledge be made public? The, the short answer is that everything that we are doing is being done in conjunction and compliance with public health standards. And so even the plan that we have to turn into the campus, which is our proposal for exceptions, has to meet the criteria and get a sign off by public health. Uh, when we're talking about opening up a dorm, that has to meet sign off by public health. So all the distancing requirements, what are you doing to test and trace people? What are you doing if somebody is impacted by that? How do you then trace those people, isolate people? All of those things are being done. But what is also true and why we are opening up in a very limited fashion in the two to 5% range is that we have to meet a standard that says, if you open anything up, what is your capacity to be able to offer and render cleaning services, disinfectant services to make sure that whatever space that is, is rendered safe and effective for the next cohort of people who will occupy it. And so that is what Vice President Deb Wallace and her crew have been working on in terms of developing those plans. So as soon as we have that available, right, we will be able to roll that out. But again, uh, as we're going principally virtual in the fall, that'll be happening on a limited basis. But for everything that is face-to-face, -face, they will have to meet those uh, rigorous standards for physical distancing, for testing, for being able to trace, and making sure that we have accommodations for those folk who, even as we open up face-to-face, -face, are not able or unwilling to be in those spaces. We have to make sure we have accommodations for them as well. So thank you for that question. Uh, Cara, let's go back to you and see if there are other hands we want to call on or phone numbers. I, at this time, I, wel I welcome everybody to um, raising their hands if they have questions to ask. Um, I, Juan Bernal has posted Army ROTC. Since Army physical training is not a recognized CSUDH activity or sport, will ROTC still be able to conduct their physical training requirements without violating CSUDH policy? Yeah, I think we were able to answer that one earlier. Answer that one, I believe. Yeah, so I think we've already answered that one. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm just going through these qu questions as no, quick. Take your time. You uh, you grabbed all three of those about the safety. Um, okay, so Bonnie Seaton is asking, how will the workshops and seminars for virtual learning be announced to the students, and will they be offered before the fall 2020 semester? I think I answered that also that we have this master calendar that Dr. Costino is putting together. We expect that any day now that we'll share with this both for faculty and students what those will be available. And there are plans to try and do this, particularly with students that are already in our transition classes over the summer. We historically have had a long program called Early Start. And so we're getting support for students in their summer transition before they start officially in the fall. So there are plans on that front along with the master calendar. Great. Thank you. Also, um, a couple of questions that have come in, uh, one in particular that's about services and assistance for students with disabilities. I really encourage those folks who, who feel strongly that they have um, challenges 
Adam Casarda may or may not be on this Zoom, but I strongly encourage folks to reach out to our Student Disability Resource Center to talk about any challenges they're having in the virtual space, navigating courses, access and technology. We have a phenomenal SDRC center and Carter is among the best directors in the system and we can be sure to take care of students' needs. We also know that if there's still some technology and connectivity issues, that are going on. Chris Enriquez and his team have done a phenomenal job in terms of trying to mitigate all of those, and there's still more to do, but I strongly encourage the students um, who may have issues with access around um, to contact Adam Casarda and Student Disability Resource Center. That's a fantastic question, and we have to ensure that all those students' needs are met, and I think we're doing some really good work, but we don't, any student that's overlooked is one student too many. Dr. Franklin, Adam has his hand up, so I'm going to give him permission to go ahead and speak. Yeah, here. That's good. He's a much better spokesperson than I am. Go ahead, Adam. Good hey, afternoon, Adam. everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for the time. And no, Dr. Franklin, you did a fantastic job. You said everything I was going to say. Um, yes, if students need anything, again, we are a case-by-case, -case, individual by individual basis. So encourage them to reach out to our office in any way, shape, or form. We have weekly virtual drop-in hours. We're going to start those for brand new students starting in a couple of weeks, um, so they're not a couple, next week, so they can come in and, and, and virtually see us and ask any questions. Again, just refer any student that works, says anything about disability, um, condition, injury, please forward them onto our office uh, as soon as possible so we can help them. Perfect. And Adam, let's make it easy for folk to find you. So what's the best way to find you? DSS at csu.dh.edu. Uh, okay, a little, little slower so they can, whoever's <laughs> writing notes. DSS at csudh.edu. That's our office email. There it is right there. So please make sure we take advantage of that. Also, let me recommend to folk that um, while I think uh, Adam is, is superb and the center more than ready to uh, reasonably accommodate anything that we can. This is uncharted territory that we are in focus. We've been saying before, there is no playbook for this. And so there is always something that we may learn or mm, not discover. We don't know what we don't know in some respects. So if you find there's something new we haven't thought about, please let us know. That's part of what we're trying to do, not only in centers like Adams, but with that uh, fall recovery planning committee that both Cheryl and Dang are uh, co-chairing as well for us. Okay, Cara, next question. Uh, so you guys are doing a fabulous job of answering all the questions either in live. We have two open questions and actually one of them is just the thank you. Um, but Kurti has um, another commentary. Kurti, do you wanna raise your hand and say that live because there's a lot, otherwise I'm happy to read it. It's a suggestion. I'm going to go ahead and read it. Um, she says, thank you, President Parham and VP Franklin and AVP. Tron Rung, I'm, dang, I apologize. Hopefully we can get more granular and become the model urban university that President Parham named for us. Also, I have a vision related to what Provost Bagna said, add cool to portability and move from a serving of those who do not have internet service to making our outdoor spaces the space to be. If we could capture the moment to build community and make it cool to get to campus for connectivity, become the hub of quote unquote fueling up on Teddy Toro using the network, giant TV screen, drive through technology, hardware, pickup and service, wave at Teddy Toro, et cetera. Make it a moment where we can celebrate our campus outdoor spaces from the safety of our vehicles. She says, now I'll be quiet. Good luck submitting the report. Yep, what she said. <laughs> oh, I see. So now you want us to be cool. Um, I think she wants that. us to start having drive-ins. We need to convert our campus to a drive-in. That's what I hear out of that. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, and certainly we support that. What I want to do, and I, I thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Selly, for uh, the accolade, but um, it really is this whole team who's been doing that. Let me see if I can find uh, Vice President Manriquez again, who I've been bragging about this kind of plan and other stuff that he's got in place. Um, and I want him to describe it to you, but I also want to give it you with this kind of provision and, and asterisk, which is we are, ladies and gentlemen, a resource constrained campus. We are in fact resource constrained in terms of both finance as well as people. 
And so it is almost a zero sum game. So even as weakness is being exposed in things like technology and things like other places, we can make it a priority to fix it and address it. But it means that we have to then repurpose funds or people that were in other places into these other areas that we now know demand right more attention in the immediate moment. Chris is fond of saying, so I want to quote you right, Vice President Manriquez, what got us here is not what's going to get us there. And so once you take the mic and tell people what we, what we do and try to address some of what uh, Dr. Selly just talked about. So Dr. Selly, I'm going to have to how you have moving into expanding Wi-Fi and having group parking lot zones and into the core that is to provide those type of facilities is uh, in addition to that we're looking at adding services on the inside to what was brought earlier around instructional services and utilizing more of the that leverage that infrastructure both Chris unfortunately yeah. we're breaking up we're not yeah. able to relationships that ensure Some of what you're saying sounds like it's being distorted. Yeah, very and uh, let me give you a second just to clear that up because I think that answer is real important because I think what you and your team have been doing is absolutely essential. Uh, you want to take the I mic back I'm again? Back. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I dropped off, but I'll just quickly cover some of this. The infrastructure are part of the planning. This includes such the drive up services that are of Chris, can I invite you to maybe type your response into the chat or the uh, the, the question that might yes. be easier. It sounds like it's still distorting, but let me yeah. let me just answer for him while we invite him to chat that. Uh, given the distortion on his mic, that all those things you talk about, Dr. Selly, not just because they're cool, but because they contribute to the standard of excellence we want to be able to provide are on his radar screen. And we have looked at trying to outfit different corners of the campus, parking lots, campus spaces, et cetera, as well as classrooms to be able to get some of that done. So uh, we are on that space. And if we happen to be cool in the process, that's even better. But we want to do it just because it's the right thing to do because our students deserve it. And that's the kind of excellence we ought to demand out of what I hope to be the model urban university in this nation. So thank you for that. Uh, Cara, other question? We are at 122 and the questions have slowed down to not even a trickle any longer. So, so we've got just about seven, eight minutes left in our uh, uh, town hall. Again, for those who joined us late, this is a town hall to update you on the proposal to provide exceptions. We are presenting the exceptions document to the chancellor's office. There are about 12 questions we have to answer about the number of courses given the range of courses we provide, which are around 2,800 plus or minus a couple. Uh, we've narrowed it down to somewhere between 126 and 130 of those courses, about 4% that we are proposing for exception. They are in three principal areas, uh, which include uh, arts and humanities, they include some of the health spaces, some of the education spaces as well. Um, and so as we put that forward, again, we cannot approve those yet. This is simply a proposal that is being signed off by this committee, signed off by public health, represented to me via the provost. I sign off on it, we send it to the chancellor and the chancellor's office and that team will have to approve it before we are able to put any of these things in place. And as the provost talked about the master calendar, we'll have a master calendar in place that'll kind of chart some of the things that we're trying to do on campus to keep people informed about what we want to be able to do. So we've got about, oh, what looks like about five minutes left. Point values are definitely tripled now. So I want to see if there are any remaining questions or chats we haven't had a chance to uh, mention that have come to mind. Go ahead and type your questions in. Yeah, I don't see any. Or you can raise your hand. Yeah, you can raise your hand if you have any other questions you'd like to raise. 
and we still got a fair number of people. So we've got way in excess of 300 something people on this line and multiple people may be in one location. Um, that's still a good crowd. Um, although we will have a hard stop, I think at 1.30. While we're waiting on those additional questions, let me see if I can just make a round through some of the other principals here who've been on it for any last words that they'd like to say in our last few minutes. Let me start with um, Ken O'Donnell and the plan itself. Ken, any last words for this? None for me. I think you guys covered all of the high points, especially the just underscoring this is a sliver of a much bigger story and there's a lot more work ahead of us. Um, so it's a point in time, but uh, it's one that I think puts us in good shape. Good, and again, a reminder that this is a dynamic, not a static entity. So we will be able to make addendum and adjustments to this uh, as Dr. Franklin tell you. Dr. Franklin, any last words for our group? Nope, none, I think we got it. Okay, good, good. Vice President Manrique is talking about technology. Hopefully your technology is working now a little better than it was a minute ago. Any last words for our people? stuff it causes problems i understand so uh good sounds like we're still getting the distortion there but i think you'll respond to that in chat so we're good uh let me go to cheryl and dang any last words for our people i'm sure um if anybody has any questions concerns they can email us at recovery planning dot at csudh dot edu and we'd be happy to take your questions and try to answer them. Okay, good. Dang, anything else from you? Okay, uh, we have a couple final questions here. One has to do with uh, what about research activity on campus? And I think I saw Dr. Price, who used to be in my Hollywood Square, but maybe he's on a different page. Dr. Price, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Yeah, why don't you uh, take that one? What about, somebody's asking about What's the status of our research activity on campus? Yeah, I actually just answered that uh, in the chat box, but the, the short answer is that we have produced a document, a, a draft document detailing how we plan to return to normal research activities. It's a several phased approach, much like uh, the return to normal educational uh, uh, capabilities. That document is currently, we've just received comments from several of the faculty members. Um, I'm still waiting for some comments from EHNS and risk management. I'm hoping to finalize this document by tomorrow or early next week at the latest. Good, thank you, Dr. Price, appreciate that. Uh, people have also been asking about a town hall in the future. So this will not be the last one. I think, uh, as I thank Kara and Fidel and that whole team for helping us put this on, we've gotten pretty good at this but we will plan on doing a couple of these into the fall, but certainly one will have a major one that will actually lay out what has been approved and what we are really putting in stone for the fall uh, semester. So please uh, stay tuned for that. And we will look forward to that. Uh, Mr. Provost, last words for our audience. Well, I shared this the other day and I'll say it again here. Um, there's always a notion you can, go, uh, you can go faster on your own, but you can go further together. And we, are on such a, we were on such a positive trajectory as a campus and as a community before the pandemic, we're gonna ensure that we're on that same trajectory on the other side of this pandemic and to require all of us to work together. I started with an expression of gratitude and I'll end my portion of this by expressing another round of gratitude for all of our community, our faculty, our staff, our students, our administrators, our colleagues out in the field, because uh, I think in many ways, Dominguez Hill should be very proud of the work that we continue to do to try and support learning and fulfill dreams of students in our community that really want to be out there. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Provost. Um, I'll also add, there was a, a last question that came in about when can we expect an answer from the chancellor's office? So barring any last minute stuff, we will have this document either out late tonight or no later than first thing in the morning. Hopefully it'll be by midnight tonight. And yes, your management team does work that late. Uh, if we have that back to them, it will go through a first level of review with a committee in the chancellor's office. Once they finish with it, and again, they're reviewing all 23 from different campuses, uh, it will go to the chancellor and his senior leadership team. So we expect no more than probably a week to 10 days. Uh, if we can get it in three to five, that's even better, but I would be surprised if it took more than a 10-day period, that two weeks, to be able to get that back to us. 
So I expect that we'll have uh, good news. I think our piece is real tight. Ken and his team and other folk have done some really good work. So we expect to have that within the next couple of weeks and we'll keep you posted on that via an announcement. Uh, and yes, we will do continue town halls. I wanna end by uh, inviting all of you to provide First of all, a thank you to yourselves. We have been in this together. We thank you for all of the feedback you have provided us and the consultation you've provided. Um, and whether you've sent it into the committee, communicated it, argued for the courses, helped us out, it has all been helpful in helping us to get to the space. I wanna say thank you to that. I wanna thank again our faculty. I wanna thank our department chairs. I wanna thank our associate and assistant deans. I wanna thank our deans who have done just your person's work on being able to help us get to this space and help us put forward what I think is a pretty uh, a magnificent proposal. Uh, we continue to be optimistic. The opportunities for us to continue working are still there. We're making adjustments on that third floor library situation. So we are still moving forward with that. We are uh, uh, outfitting the science and innovation building. We are continuing to build on the innovation and instruction building. We, uh, the dorms, uh, new 506, uh, living learning community, I should call it, uh, are almost poised to be open and outfitted with furniture, I think by the 22nd of this month. So we are using this time as an opportunity to really just upgrade Dominguez Hills in the way it is. Lastly, what I'll say, my friends, and this is the bias of your president, as I thank you for honoring me with the opportunity to serve this campus, that I am acutely aware that even as we are in this mode of recovery, I am not satisfied with recovery. What I am happy with is that if we think about recovery, recovery assumes that what you're recovering back to was normal and healthy in the first place. And given how constrained we are with personnel, constrained we are with resources, constrained we are with technology, et cetera, I'm not trying to recover back to where we were. I'm trying to reset and transform to where we should have been all along. So know that is the posture that myself and this entire cabinet right, are assuming as we try to argue for more resources and position us to be even better than ever. So as Vice President Manriquez says, what has gotten us here is not what's gonna get us here. And as we aspire to close the gap between where we are and that model university we wanna be, we're gonna to try to do the best we can on all of your behalf. So on behalf of all of this cabinet, on behalf of all the people who joined us today, I wanna to express my thanks and appreciation for your participation here and attendance at this Zoom call. Stay tuned for further announcements on that. And we thank you very much for doing that. And thank Cara and Fidel for helping us navigate this space. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody.